according to my parents, raising children of the country, all cities were bad. My foods are not good for you. They're evil. They taste funny and they have crap in them. But no, <laughs> that doesn't happen because it's a family function. And why would anything go as planned? Most of my time is really good because I spend a lot of it reading and having good cups of coffee. Hello and welcome to The Far Away Nearby. This is episode 19, and today I am here with the Madame Sue. Hello, Sue. Hello, DJ. How are you today? I'm well, and we also have a very special guest, Zombie Girl TJ. Hello. Hello, DJ. TJ. TJ and DJ. Yeah, that's (laughs) kind of confusing here. (laughs) Well, so um, if you'll hang tight, folks, we're just going to go over our usual peaks and valleys, the ups and downs of our weeks, and then we'll get right into our guest and uh, see what's going on with her. So, Sue, how was your week? What's new with you? Well, my week has not been going real well. Um, The surgery that I had done to my hand, to my left hand, Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, has been very painful. And I think all in all, it's the worst surgery that I have had done to anything. Hmm. All this other stuff that was big, expensive, uh, expansive surgery has not been anything compared to this little tiny thing on my hand. Uh, <laughs> I, I needed it done, and it will eventually feel better, I hope. But it is really painful. And it seems like it's going to continue to be painful for a while. Uh, They took the cast off of it last Monday, and we started physical therapy, and we will continue that for a month. And, oh, and they put a... uh, They put a brace kind of thing on it uh, to to hold it so I can't use it. Mm Mm-hmm which doesn't really make it so I can't use it, but if I use it, it is it really hurts. Thus, I don't really want to use it, and as my house it, it keeps getting worse and worse, <laughs> <laughs> the Duke is not the best substitute housekeeper. And considering I'm not the best housekeeper in the world, and he's not a very good substitute, uh, things just keep getting worse and worse. I think I'm going to have to go out and hire a a housekeeping staff. Well, you have two perfectly capable granddaughters. but Yeah, well, they come over and they don't always get things done well. I see. And we end up talking a lot and then... (laughs) I think hiring a, 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 a housekeeping staff will make me happier. Mm-hmm. Did your uh, did your granddaughter get to sign your cast before it came off? Yes, she did. Oh, yay! I'm sure but, she was happy about that. I'm sure she was. But the other but the other thing about the cast these days is they're no longer made out of plaster. They're made out of like a fiberglass kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So it's really hard to write on. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so I didn't go. I didn't go looking for people to sign my cast, but she was happy about that. Yeah. She got to sign it. I don't think she's ever gotten to sign a cast, and she may never get to sign a cast again. But, um, but they come off really easy. I because they put two casts on. You know, they had to take the first one off because it was it got too big. And then, of course, they put another one on right after that. And and uh, when they took it off, they they have this thing that looks sort of like a saw, but it's it's more of a vibrating thing. So mm-hmm. it it doesn't hurt. It doesn't touch your skin, you know. And the doctor demonstrated this by poking his finger back and forth in the in the what I guess is a saw blade or. A vibrating thing. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I know. I just know that every time I've seen a cast taken off on television, I have to cringe because I, you know, there's just something in me where I can't think that that little blade is actually not like sharp, sharp. 
Uh, I don't know if it's sharp. I I didn't try and stick my finger in it, (laughs) but it didn't touch me. I mean, it really, when he stuck his finger in it, Mm -hmm. it stopped. I mean, like immediately. Yeah. So uh, it almost anticipated his finger. And, and so it stopped right, right then. Yeah. So was there a good point of your week? Something better that made you happy? Well, uh, it, Possibly not this week, but the week before, uh, the oldest granddaughter and I went to the movies. Right, and we talked about that last time. Yeah, I, did we actually talk about the movies? I don't remember that. Yeah. But I was really impressed with the uh, Hidden Numbers movie. And you should all go and see that. <laughs> that that's the movie that I wanted to see. In fact, my sister is picking up a second job, Betty. And, mm-hmm. and she does tax preparation, so it's going to be her busy season shortly. And uh, she's trying to coordinate with me to visit before she's busy for the next three months. I yeah. really want to see this movie with her, but I'm not sure that that's going to happen. So, okay, well that was um, that was your week. Now, um, in terms of my week, um, well, continuing on from the kitchen saga where we've decided to get rid of our microwave um we have decided that we're going to start dieting together now uh, something that i haven't necessarily mentioned before in the past is that my husband has a few food allergies and he really hasn't stuck to what he should be eating I mean, uh, it's it's not to the point where he'll uh, break out in a rash or anything like that, but he does notice that he is in better sorts when he pays attention to those allergies. And I was saying before, during the holidays, it was really difficult for him because he was working an early shift regularly, and that's mm-hmm. something that's difficult for him to wake up early. Um now that he has made an effort to get healthier again, he is actually waking up either with his alarm or before his alarm. And what's exciting about that is that he's teaching me better habits when it comes to what we should be eating. Um, cool. <laughs> I I just recently passed uh, a few, well, before the holidays, a year with my gym. I decided I want to do that bit by 40 thing that you can read all the trending on. And so I joined a gym a year ago, hoping to be in better shape for my 40th birthday. Well, that's still a work in progress, but, um, I talked to my husband about how I'm frustrated with having been at this gym a year. And while I did lose weight in the first six months, with the stress of the holidays and just the holidays in general, I'm almost basically back to where I started. Mm-hmm. So he sat down with me, and I was using a tracker where I enter in you know, what I'm eating that day. Mm-hmm. And when he saw the information from what I was eating, and now I, you know, I wasn't eating birthday cake every day or anything. <laughs> You know, exactly. <laughs> Come on, why not? Like that. But, um, you know, the, the, the vending machine called my name now and then. <laughs> and, um, well, long story not so short, it basically I'm eating apparently three times the amount of carbs that I should. Ooh. And he was telling me that with my regular routine, I'm basically just maintaining because – I'm having more than my body can burn off. Yeah. But not to the point where I'm gaining weight. So he uh, he had some fitness books and he decided that it's going to be easier for us to do this as a team. Mhm. And so we can of course do the shopping for us both together and now I'm learning to eat every couple of hours and I'm eating different things. And it's strange because I'm retraining my body and, you know, I don't ever expect to be a skinny mini (laughs) because even in high school, I had a size 36 jeans. You know, it's in my DNA. I'm a big person, but um, 
it's it's strange eating every couple of hours i'm i'm not starving to where you know i want to get a big bag of potato chips out and devour the whole thing while i'm playing a video game yeah so i i never thought i would be able to say this um I, you know, I did sort of revamp my lifestyle when my ex and I had broken up and I had gotten my apartment across from work. And then my routine was me going home to take my dog for a walk on lunch. And I would just have chicken and rice because it was a quick and simple, healthy thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> of course, back then I didn't own a car, so I was doing significantly more walking than I am now. So we'll see. Um, I think that in the week that I've been doing this, I've already lost a couple of pounds. And hubby seems to think that in three months, I could actually reach my goal, which is around 50 pounds or so. Supposedly, I should be a little lighter than that for my mm -hmm. you know, my body mass index. But I've, I've never, you know, been that fit. So... So um, the low point was, of course, me having to say goodbye to the vending machine. And the high point was that we're saving lots on our groceries now. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, if you don't buy all that junk, you, you, you aren't spending nearly as much money, I think. Right. So is he getting any results out of this? Is he, does he? That was our 15 minute mark. So, okay. <laughs> so um, yes, uh, like I said, he is um, noticing that he is able to wake up much more easily. He's waking up early, and he's actually making us breakfast because he's trying to get me into a new routine where he, basically the key is to eat early when you wake up so that you're not getting hungry quickly mm -hmm. and you're not craving things that you shouldn't. So. All right. Well, those were our weeks, and now we're going to uh, have a little chat with our guest zombie girl, TJ. Hello there. Hi, TJ. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. A lot of us know you from your beginnings with the Greetings from Nowhere gals, Christina and Nicole. Mm -hmm. how, how long uh, have you known them, and um, how did you become acquainted well, first I met Nicole because she came up from California to nowhere here in Wenatchee and started working for the company that I work for, which is the public utility district here in Chelan County. We're essentially the electric company, and we also do some water and wastewater services, although the city has the bulk of that. But I was working on a software project to implement PeopleSoft for our company, and I had a very good friend named Jackie who I had worked closely with on this on the project. She and I actually shared a very small office at one point, and we were just like sisters. And she was looking around as this project was coming to a close for another job because the job that she had on the implementation project was not going to last. And she had applied and interviewed for a job as the admin assistant in the IT department. And lo and behold... She didn't get the job, which I thought she would, and this, this Nicole character got the job. <laughs> and so, you know, we hated her <laughs> immediately. <laughs> and Nicole knows this story. It's like, you know, who is this person? Who is this outsider who doesn't even live in Wenatchee? She came in from California, of all things, and <laughs> took Jackie's job. Um, but I, that was in 2004. And in 2005, lo and behold, here comes Nicole saying, hey, does anybody want to put on a play? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> why? And she put together a group of people from the PUD. We called ourselves the Run of the River Players. And she and another gal named Kelly wrote a, a kid's show that was about an hour long called Trouble in Praline Valley. And it was a, a Western with a character who had started from her, her parents' dairy farm, had started an ice cream parlor and how there was bad guys coming in trying to you know, rustle the ice cream recipes and the cattle. And they put it all together and cast me in it, and I had a great time with that. So that's really where Nicole and I became friends was in 2005 after I got over my chip on my shoulder of her <laughs> taking my friend's job. 
And we have been fast friends ever since. And then in 2006, she auditioned for and was cast in the Vagina Monologues, which was put on with Mission Creek players that we were kind of both a part of. I had been a part of it for quite a while, and she was getting involved in it. And that's where Christina was also cast in that. So I didn't meet Christina until after she had done the performance. I saw her in the performance, and I thought she was really good at it. And she and Nicole had gotten quite close, and she ended up joining Mission Creek players players to do other things and being part of plays that we did and directed a couple of them and being on the board. And so we got really tied together after that, after 2006, being sort of the movers and the shakers on the Mission Creek players theater board for about four or five years. And then she moved, Christina moved to San mm-hmm. Jose and um, we miss her a lot. So we did a lot of theater together and that if you, if you like the people you're doing theater with, it, it tends to bind you pretty closely together. It's it's just really great to do creative, artistic things together. What have you been up to since the last Brain Dead? Well, that, yeah, that's before Thanksgiving that we did the last Brain Dead episode. We did one shortly after I got back from taking care of my mom in Colorado who had broken her hip. And as soon as I'd gotten settled back in, we did one. And then there was the holidays, which we spent here. We did Christmas and New Year here. And I got involved with doing the play Rumors, which is a Neil Simon farce with the, another local theater group here. We have kind of a lot of theater going on here where I live. And that was the Music Theater of Wenatchee. So that just came to a close last weekend. We did three weekends of performances, and it was really fun. It's a very funny show. If you get a chance to see Rumors, it's great. And we basically tore it all down and cleaned up the theater last weekend. So this is sort of my first downtime weekend in several weeks because we've been doing theater things. And it's been kind of weird. Um, and working, you know, I work a, a full-time job. I'm a risk analyst at the at the Public Utility District. So we've been doing a lot of year-end wrap-up stuff and making sure we have our risk register updated and now it's the new year and we're putting together performance plans and figuring out what we're going to promise to do this year. So it's been a lot of work and not enough theater, but a little bit of theater. And now I've got no theater in the immediate future. So that makes me a little sad, but this week I went to our local performing arts center where they were showing a movie, which they do once a month. And this month it was the book of life, which is a computer animated story um that's got a like a mexican origin to it i think they took some severe liberties with the actual mexican mythology that went behind it but it's really super cute and it was kind of fun to see it on the big screen because i'd only ever seen it on tv and then last night i went to a friend's house with some other actor theater people and we did a read through of the script for 12 angry men which someone is proposing to do this fall so well, that's not that's sort of fun yeah, test driving the script to see how we liked it. Nice. It holds, it holds up really well for being written in like 1955. You just yeah. make a few newer references in it, and we've got those same problems today. Yeah, that's it, that's unfortunate, but it was so true. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, uh, how did you first get into acting, TJ? I guess I started in junior high. We actually had a drama class in junior high and like a drama one and a drama two. So I took that and was cast in the shows that we did. And then in high school, really didn't do anything because our high school did musicals. And I'm not I'm not a strong singer and I'm not a trained dancer. So I really didn't have what it took to get into the musicals. So I took a long hiatus until about. 2003, when I joined up with our local haunted theater and did, which is their big fundraiser, and did, um, you know, some monstering for them. And then the next year, actually, I think, I guess it was 2000, so that was the end of 2003. And then in 2005, it started in 2004, but we actually did the production in 2005. We did Death Trap, and I was cast in that. And I've sort of never looked back from that. I've even actually managed to do a couple of musicals since then. Oh. <laughs> So most of it's been done here in nowhere. Okay. I didn't really dabble with acting in high school, but I I tried being in a couple of plays and dark if they didn't have those, um, you know, you can't be on suspension requirements. (laughs) (laughs) 
oh man <laughs> <laughs> i i tried out for bye bye birdie and, mm-hmm. and the only thing i basically got to learn is that it's um mcafee and not mcafee <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I did, uh, you know, as one does, I done my time in the customer service call center world. And every now and then I'll just call back and say, you know, that intro to acting class I took in community college really helps out. <laughs> Absolutely. I don't know. I posted something about that on Facebook a couple of weeks ago where an actor friend here in town was saying, you know, darn it, I wish I could have acting as my job i wish i could make a living acting and i'm like oh please we how many times have our acting skills kept us from getting fired we are making a living from acting okay (laughs) what has been your most challenging and or favorite role to portray well let's see i would say challenging as far as it being a character that i really had to work to get right would have been Dr. Armstrong from And Then There Were None, which is the Agatha Christie mystery. Hmm. Normally played by a man, but our director switched it up and put more female characters in it. And it's a serious drama. There's no light moment. There's no intentionally light moments that make you laugh. There's a, there's a couple things that are darkly funny, but... Yeah. Um, and, I'm, and I love comedy. So that one really just having to having to think all the time about what my character was doing. That was, that was challenging. Also, I did a Teresa Rebeck play called bad dates and that's a one woman show. So that, that took me about six months to learn all the lines too. Yeah. <laughs> Cause it's, it's quite a line load, but my favorite, I would say recently last year, about this time we were doing Boeing, Boeing. And I got to play the French housekeeper, Berta, who, <laughs> I didn't realize how funny she was when I read the script as we were as we were rehearsing and the show was moving along. I'm like, oh, man, she has really got the best stuff. She's she's the, the audience is like so in her pocket because they're they're seeing this long suffering. I'm putting up with this stuff that my employer is throwing at me, juggling his three girlfriends. And now we have a house guest, too, that she just really can do physical humor and her lines are funny and you can add stuff in like sneaking a drink out of a cognac bottle. And I really enjoyed playing Berta. (laughs) (laughs) No, if I remember right, uh, Boeing, Boeing, when it was made into, well, actually I think it was a movie first, wasn't it? I think it's, I think it was a play first and then a movie. It was originally written in French. So it, it it was probably a play play in France and then got translated and made into a movie. I, I know I've seen the movie, and if I'm not mistaken, I think that Tony Curtis is in it? Correct. Okay. Mm-hmm. And I I feel sorry, or I feel sad when I watch that, because I realize that I I missed the, the romance of the jet-setting lifestyle growing up when I did, because I'll never get to take a Concorde. Right. <laughs> right. It's yeah. true, and you, you will also never get to be that cruel to, to a female and just accept it. <laughs> Well, they, uh, you know, I mean, that that kind of thing was was kind of accepted as as you could do that. And it was all right. And well, uh, it, my coworkers have been known to have to put up with me once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> as any listener of the Brain Dead podcast would know, you, of course, enjoy science fiction and gaming and mm-hmm. I was wondering, what is your favorite science fiction show, past and or present? Oh, man. There are so many. I don't know if I can pick one favorite, <laughs> but I'm a, I'm a Star Trek original series fan, which I know people laugh at, but that's I grew up on that. I mean, it started when I was about four years old, and I used to yeah. sneak de- after I'd been put to bed, and I would hear the m- opening music. I would crawl down the hallway and, and lay down flat on the carpet and watch the TV between the legs of my dad's armchair. And I would fall asleep back there, and my mom would find me. So I still have a soft spot for that. And Doctor Who, and again, I'm a little bit behind the times on everybody because my my favorite doctor is Tom Baker. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, currently watching Grimm, which has been out for a while, but um, just now catching, kind of catching up on it. And I've watched a lot of Black Mirror, and I'm really Im- impressed with that. Um, a big fan of Firefly, of course, but um, we don't get any more of that, so. Mm-hmm. 
Um, I, I do love science fiction. I do love horror. I'm I. There's a lot of new horror movies out now that I'm not a particular fan of because I'm not crazy about the unresolved ending where evil wins. So it's like, ah, oh, yeah, there's another one of those out there. So. Oh but, yeah, that's uh, that that's kind of disturbing when. Yeah, and that and that sort of that sort of became a the trend, and so it's about fifty fifty now. But but yeah, I I really do enjoy some good science fiction. Yeah, I know that a while ago you and I had a brief exchange online, and it ended up with us talking about Alien Nation, the series from the night. Yes, that was a good show. Yeah, and you know, a number of years ago, I read there was some gossip going through the mill about possibly rebooting that. And Mm -hmm. at the time, it was supposed to be on Showtime, I want to say. And it was on the heels of the popularity of that movie, District 9. Mm -hmm. Which, sadly, Mm -hmm. I have to admit, I fell asleep during. (laughs) 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 That's terrible. I liked District 9. I actually had the privilege, shall I dare say, of being stranded in a hotel with the cast of Alien Nation a number of years ago. <laughs> really? Oh my gosh. This was back in, I want to say, 2006. And um, it was at a convention that I'm actually just about to go to next weekend with Toppy Smelly. And it's called Farpoint. It's a, a convention that's in North uh, Baltimore. And I kind of cut my nerd teeth on it. Farpoint had a convention as they do every year, in 2006, and it ended up being one that ended in a blizzard. And uh, (laughs) some of the vendors there had the resources to make up T-shirts, and they started calling it SnowCon. Uh (laughs) (laughs) So, And it's funny because every day that we were stuck there extra, they added days onto the number of the (laughs) T-shirt. And... uh, Anyways, uh, the uh, some of the guests of honor were the cast of Alien Nation and also Erin Gray from Buck Rogers. Mm-hmm. And she actually did yoga classes where she raised money for charity. Oh, how fun. So they, they put on extra days of entertainment to try and keep the peace. <laughs> how fun. Well, when you're there, give Toppy a hug for me. I will. And... Um, I love me some Toppy Smelly. Is there a role you haven't played that you would jump at the chance to? Yes. Our current Apple Blossom musical that's in production right now, which I'm not a part of because I have some travel plans that that are interfered with it, is Young Frankenstein. And I would have loved to have tried out for (laughs) Frau Blucher because I would have – the lady who got it, there's no chance I would have beat her. She's amazing. But I would love to be Frau Blucher. (laughs) <laughs> um, I have done the Rocky Horror Show, as, and I was a Transylvanian, and my friend um, Matthew was playing Magenta in drag, and he actually got sick one night, and I got to play Magenta, and I would do that again in a heartbeat. Ooh, that does sound like fun. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of Young Frankenstein, um, that is the uh, the play that, when it was done as a movie, Gene, or, um, Gene Wilder, isn't it, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I, I I don't know what it is that sticks with me, but uh, wasn't Dom DeLuise in that as well? No, I don't think he was. Um, he was in Blazing Saddles, there, but I don't, I don't think he was in Young Frankenstein. Yeah. I think the movie you were thinking of with Dom DeLuise was Haunted Honeymoon. Yes. Because Gene Wilder was then in that as well. Though I've been that's been perking around the back of my brain. Oh, <laughs> as a cat owner and an animal lover, what is the most endearing thing that your pets do? Well, I have two. I have Mingo, who's long haired and he's orange and white. And I have Norny, who is a little tuxedo cat with short hair. Mingo has for a long time now, he sleeps draped across my neck. So I'm I'm laying on my side with my face in the pillow and he comes towards me the way I'm facing And he drapes himself across my neck so that his head and his front legs are behind my head and his rear end is right up under my chin. And uh, it sometimes it's annoying, but most of the times it's very, very comforting. And he does it just about every night, which means I have a lot of cat hair on my pillows. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I've almost given up using the, um, you know, the uh, the the cling sheets to try to get the cat hair off. Mm hmm. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's the only thing I'll use fabric softener for is the sheets so that the cat hair will release. 
Sprite. Yeah, we we have three cats. We have a uh, calico, we have a tortoise shell, and then we have an orange tabby. And the two girls are dwarf cats, and the male is the only full size kitty. And it's just hysterical because so many male cats have a tendency not to care for the little ones. Mm-hmm. Well, ours will actually groom our female. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, his name is Oliver, so I just think of Oliver Twist. <laughs> oh. Mingo is very, very protective, like big brotherish of Norny. Uh, when we, when I was still married and we had five cats, the other cat, two of the other cats wanted to beat up on her because she was the newest and the smallest. Oh. And he would stick up for her, and then after they had harassed her, he'd go over to her and lay down next to her and lick her ears and stuff and Aww. just be a really good big brother to her. Oh. One of the things that I've mentioned to a few other Pride 48ers, and this isn't one of the questions that we discussed, <laughs> but um, not really a question so much as a comment, I, I thought that it would be a great idea if we got some of the Pride 48 podcasters to come up with an impromptu remake of a play like do um steel magnolias and then we could pick our pride 48 personalities to play the different characters (laughs) that's pretty funny actually i'm pretty sure there's a number of them that have that show memorized oh yeah (laughs) but uh i i think that um the top suggestion for the characters were of course like Malin and, um, oh, who are Olympi Dukakis's character? And, um, shoot, I'm forgetting the twosome that were friends. Shirley MacLaine, that's right. But, uh, so of course, uh, maybe, uh, Shirley MacLaine and Olympia Dukakis's character should be played by Auntie Vera and Big Fatty. <laughs> <laughs> that would work. <laughs> and I think somebody said, that Malin should maybe be Taffy Carlyle Offington. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're onto something. But then uh, one of the nowhere gals would need to be Shelby, and one of you would need to be. I'm forgetting um, uh, what's her name, uh, Daryl Hannah's character, the one that was kind of demure. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, I'm sure that uh, amongst. I think I think Adam Burns should play Shelby. <laughs> <laughs> Because oh. he's so, because he's so young and cute. Now, can we can we get Daniel to uh, be Malin and and shove the juice in his face? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, that's all the questions that I had there. Um, you know, in case, uh, uh, just in case I've missed anything, Sue, did you have anything you wanted to ask TJ? Do you find in your in your area or your troop that you have difficulties finding enough male actors? Yes, very very okay. commonly we do. Yeah. So there's usually way more women trying out than we need, and there's usually just barely enough men trying out. Yeah, hmm. I I just wondered about that because I have noticed that is seems to be a a trend throughout and uh, everything I have seen regarding acting. Um, I don't know why I just, but it does seem like there's, there's just never enough men around and there's always too many women. But uh, I I guess since we are, we don't hold so much to the uh, notion that you have to, to stick to, to um, gender identification as much as we used to. When there's, I, Go ahead. I was going to say when I was a kid, uh, you know, having a girl play a boy or a boy play a girl, unless it was for for laughter, it was it just was not a go that you just didn't do that. And now it seems OK to do that. And sometimes you get some really interesting um, aspects of, of plays and, and results from plays uh, when you have other uh, you, the opposite gender play the role. There's a, a number of classic shows like And Then There Were None and Twelve Angry Men where it's very male heavy in the ca- in the casting and the way it was written. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of people have found that you can bring a woman character in that change the gender pronouns a little bit and it still works very well. I think in my 
experience, men dressing up as women and playing women has always been funnier than women dressing up as men. Although with last week's Saturday Night Live, I think maybe we might have turned the corner on that with Melissa I'm... McCarthy playing Sean Spicer. And I, <laughs> you know, I, I, I hope that that signals a trend of, you know, look, the, the women have the chops to do this and it's hysterical when they do. Yeah. I, because I, I, I I've played a man it. character in Bat Boy where I actually, you know, dressed up as a man and, and talked and, and talk and sang in a very low voice and played Bud. And I thought it worked and I really enjoyed it, but I don't think anybody thought of it as terribly funny in fact, a couple people didn't recognize me and actually thought I was a guy. So you know, I guess I did yeah. it okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think that maybe um, some of the drag culture that people don't maybe understand if they're not part of the LGBTQ community is that, um, you know, there there are probably a good number of gay men who find strength in the stories of women who have been able to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. And, uh, of course, there are a, a fair number of women who would be considered divas that a lot of gay men who maybe don't have the strength to do it themselves find inspiring. So I think that, you know, if if uh, anybody ever thinks that drag could have the possibility of insulting women because it's men impersonating women... I think that they should consider the flip side that the men who are dressing as women in these performances are finding strength possibly from the women in their lives that have inspired them. I, I, I don't see it as making fun of women. I can certainly see where it could be interpreted as that. But, I mean, women are not their wigs, their makeup, their dresses, and their high-heeled shoes, mm -hmm. and their feather boas, and whatever else you want. <laughs> yeah. You know, we, we, we put them on. There, there's a beauty standard that says a certain amount of this is expected of you. So to me, drag is making fun of that expectation and all of those props that society has said, this is what defines a beautiful woman. So, you know, usually the wigs are over the top, the makeup's over the top, the, the dresses are, you know, incredible. And, you know, and it's men walking in high heels, which we all know it, it's not easy for anybody to do that. I, I <laughs> a lot of admiration for anybody who can walk around in high heels for more than a few minutes. Mm -hmm. Certainly don't do it anymore. But to, to me, it is more, it's a combination of making fun of this ridiculous standard of femininity that we have in, and not just in this country, but a lot in this country, but at the same time, allowing these men to explore a whole nother side that, you know, society says that's that's not normal. That's not what you would present in a in outside the outside world as you wouldn't go to your job dress that way and just owning it and finding a, a real strength in saying, hey, I like doing this. I like seeing how far I can go with my hair and my makeup and my dress and my heels and my feather boas and it's it's my power and I'm grabbing it. And, you know, any woman is certainly welcome to to, to flaunt that same look. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Mariah Carey does to some extent and Cher yeah. does to some extent. And, and that's why female impersonators impersonate them is because they have such an iconic look. So I don't really see it as making fun of women. I, th I see it as making fun of the idea that we have of what is femininity. Yeah, and I think that that's um, something that we can uh, learn a lot from the past when we revisit old shows, like I've been watching that girl and mm -hmm. a lot of that that you watch, there's just so much stereotype and gender roles in that. And you take a moment and you step back and you say, wow, mm -hmm. I'm glad I didn't grow up in that time period. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's, and it's with us today with this, this patronizing business that the GOP is doing, even, you know, this week telling Elizabeth Warren that she can't talk and saying, you know, she was warned. Nevertheless, she persisted. And that is the message that women have had all their life. You were warned. You were warned that if you wore that dress, you would be molested. You were warned that if you spoke up, you would be shouted down. You were warned that if you you know, tried for this job, you would be turned down. And, you know, nevertheless, we persist. So unfortunately, it's not gone. Yeah. The, the expectation. <laughs> You have new mail. This is actually an iTunes review that was left for us a few months back. 
and it was left for us by Liam, otherwise known as Kirani Umbra, or from uh, Vera Speaks, Crayons in um, My Umbrella. So uh, Liam left us a nice review on the Australian iTunes page, and he was kind enough to share it with me. Now, of course, uh, for any of our listeners overseas, we can only see the American iTunes store. So if you're kind enough to leave us a review, please give us a screenshot if you're in another country or just copy and paste it into an email, tfnpodcast at gmail.com. But this is Liam's review. This is a show that I heard about through the Pride 48 network of podcasts. DJ is an engaging personality along with his co-host, Sue. They're funny, but it's not forced. They talk about serious stuff as well. It's like sitting down for a coffee or two or three with old friends you've known for years. It's quickly become one of my favorites. That was very nice of you, Liam. Thank you very much for our first iTunes review. That was very sweet. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to The Far Away Nearby. Visit our webpage at tfnpodcast.com. Find our fan page on Facebook and our companion blog on Tumblr. This show is available on iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher Radio. Email us at tfnpodcast at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter at tfndj. And call or text us at 720-230-6919. This show is a member of the Pride 48 Network. Find other shows at pride48.com. 